those who had questions that could not ask them uh, um, during the individual session. Incubation happens mostly in the bottom level through the attractor neural network, but also interact with the top level. So both levels contribute to the process, although uh, the bottom level implicit process is, uh, is the most important. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we did some experiments. We ran some uh, uh, human experiments with, uh, with, with a student. Uh, and uh, we tried, I don't remember the details. That's been uh, quite a few years. We tried different uh, conditions and different uh, 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 interference and so on and so forth to see what will uh, help the incubation process and what will interfere with the incubation process. And sometimes uh, in the publisher literature, uh, people shows that uh, if you try to distract the subject away from thinking about the problem, actually the result might be better. But you don't want to give them a too demanding a task because uh, that way they won't be able to, to undergo the incubation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, um, that paper was, uh, the, the human experiment was published in a cognitive science conference. I don't remember uh, which year. The, the model itself was published in Cycle Review 2010. So if I'm understanding the question, um, basically you're asking have people looked at these certain effects in kids? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Um, uh, I, I think the first place to look would be um, Alison Gopnik's work and see, our, um, and see if she's done anything along these lines. I'm not aware of anything, but I don't want to say there isn't anything out there. I don't know if anybody else would, would know. Um, it's a great question. Um, I do know that um, Gopnik has shown that with the Blicket detector, kids are actually better at, um, when you change the properties of the machines, kids pick it up much better than um, university students. So, uh, so there could be something really interesting there uh, about the type of reasoning that the kids are doing and the, and the structures that, they, um, that they're able to build. But unfortunately, I can't say much more than that. <laughs> okay. 
finite sector, finite execution. The cool thing about programs that makes them universal is that you can you can make use of unbounded recursion. Right? All that's necessary in order for a program to be useful is that it will, it will halt at some point. And you can never prove whether it will. So, so there's a similar property in probabilistic programs that as long as a probabilistic program halts with probability one, so with you know high with certainty one, it will halt eventually. It still induces a well-formed distribution of return values. And so in particular, the the kinds of well, models in, in, in any sense, the kind of models that it builds in the executions, it, it, a single program can specify an infinite space of possibilities and put a distribution over it. Um, it has to be you know, countably infinite because it's a countable machine. Um, there's a different question that you might also be asking, which is sort of like, what's the sense in which you can write down a program that can sort of imagine new situations of the world. Uh, and I think, you know, there might be an answer to that that builds on the fact that you can sort of use a program that combinatorially constructs an unbounded number of states. Uh, but then we run into Toder's problem, and it depends whether you think doorknob is a date. Uh, if you think that doorknob can be built out of primitives, then we're good. If you think that it has to be an ape, then probably that's a good. Probably that's the safest thing. I'm not sure I actually believe in the two-process distinction the way it's usually framed, though. I think it's super easy to take any phenomenon and draw a cut somewhere and say, look, it's two processes. There's like two things. And I'm really worried about the extreme variety of ways that that cut is made in different paradigms and phenomena. That makes me doubt whether it, it, there really is two fundamental parts as opposed to a very complicated thing where you can often cut it into two parts for a given task. And just as an example so that I don't sound like I'm totally <laughs> making this up and being inflammatory, um, somebody this morning mentioned this work of Evan Height um, where they argued that there are two processes, an inductive and a deductive process. Uh, Height and Rotel are building a work by Andros. Um, and they do it based on an argument a sort of signal protection theory argument that you can't capture the pattern of data that they have with a single dimensional signal protection theory model. So uh, Dan Lasseter and I looked back at that and we came up with, we have a modeling and an experimental result that really draw into question whether there's, you, have, you should think of it as two processes. So the, the modeling result is just the observation that, you know, if, if you think that confidence in an argument is a bounded scale, like say between zero and one, probability, then you can't apply signal protection area because it has to be nonlinear, otherwise you don't fix the end points. And as soon as you, you put it into a kind of nonlinear regime, like change it from an additive offset to a, a power network, like for details, you get exactly <coughs> the, the phenomenon that they report as kind of nonlinear SDT. Uh, and the probabilistic version of this, which is not just one way that much on probability, but just endpoints, actually explains the data pretty well. And then we, we take it one step further by saying, look, they did an experiment where they asked people whether the conclusion was necessary or possible. And from that said, look, there are two, you know, there have to be two systems. So then we said, we'll do the same experiment, but we'll, we'll ask whether it's plausible and possible and certain and all of the other, these are called uh, model adverbs that you can stick in. And sure enough, you get different behavior for all of them that looks like a very nice spectrum that and we claim corresponds to a, a sort of parameter in the semantics. Um, so all of a sudden, you either have to have 10 systems, or you have to have one system that simply you know, connects to the semantics with this kind of continuous model. So, so that's a concrete uh, case in which 
you look at a very complicated thing and you look at it from the point of view of a particular task and it's very easy to say, oh, these two things look different, so I'll cut it in both two systems. But I don't think that's the right way to, to approach it. I don't know, Ron probably has a violently different view of this, which is fine. <laughs> Can I respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, where do I start? Uh, <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, height work is not very relevant to establishing the uh, separation of system one and system two. And signal detection theory wasn't uh, uh, very relevant to establishing that distinction either. This line of work can be traced back to, well, I don't want to go all the way back to uh, William James, but I can, although I'm not going to. Uh, more recently, uh, for example, we look at the work, the seminal work of uh, Arthur Reber and uh, the late uh, uh, Broadband and so on and so forth the, through experimental uh, cognitive psychology experiments, basically, behavioral experiments. They uh, did a pretty good job in establishing the difference in separation, why this separation provides a succinct explanation of a larger body of uh, data and uh, phenomenon. Um, and there are also uh, neurobiological uh, evidence for that kind of separation. For example, brain damaged patients and uh, people suffering from various uh, mental disorders. You can see the uh, increased significance of uh, implicit processes, system one uh, as opposed to system two. Although, I mean, there are so much, uh, so many controversies, uh, so much, uh, so many uh, debates uh, about details of the two system. Uh, I've been uh, arguing uh, against the, some of the characterization, for example, Daniel Kahneman made about the, the difference between the two system. And so if you look at any of these uh, uh, two system theory, you can always pick out some characteristics and uh, generate some kind of arguments, some kind of examples, and so on. Yeah, but uh, the overall uh, trend, it seemed to me, is that uh, the distinction is very well established and provide uh, uh, a lot of explanatory values. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. It, it is taken as given in a lot of the field. Um, and, and I, I mean, to be fair, I also agree that there are cases where, you know, kind of relatively modular systems that interact have been identified, and that does seem useful. I guess my, my reaction is more, I think, in the field, system one versus system two has been vastly overextended as an explanation of phenomena. Um, and, and more so, like, in, in a system as complicated as the brain, or actually Clary, in any of these cognitive architectures, there's many, many, many pieces. And deciding to draw one particular cut and say that that's the important cut for explanation, I, I think kind of misguides some of our thinking about mental process. Um, you know, and then it's like, okay, do we keep up with the idea of independent, you know, relatively independent systems, and then we have to, you know, say there's more and more littler systems. Do we say, no, actually, the, the work is done by the interactions, and so it's not as useful to think about the systems. And, I mean, this may be a, a, a taste issue, but I do worry, you know. But those two, two things aren't mutually exclusive, right? That's right. I mean, you can have sort of uh, interactions between different components of the system, but also they can perform one level, say, making use of certain sorts of resources and another not making use of those resources. And so then you operationalize that as being a kind of system one, system two difference. So let's just say working memory or something, right? Like you have a system for working memory in your architecture and one makes heavy use of working memory, the other sort of set of algorithms doesn't. You're not necessarily saying that, okay, these are two modular independent systems, but you are saying that there's a qualitative way to distinguish one set of processes from another. But, but you just made it not qualitative, you made it quantitative. You said it makes relatively more use of working memory, you know, and all of a sudden it's not like, okay, there's this system and that system. It's like, oh, there's a bunch of resources. No, 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 I mean, you could say this, this one uses working memory. Yeah, yeah, so I, I agree. That's, I mean, to me, that's a more coherent way of talking about it, of resources. Maybe here's a different, different conceptualization. The question is where you want to put the explanatory burden 
And I would argue that if you can put the explanatory burden on the higher level descriptions of things like what Jennifer and my models do and explain the phenomena, that's better than resorting to the, the kind of like system one, system two, or but it's not that that I object to, the systems one, systems two kind of split, where many people appeal to different system one, different. And, and system two, and they don't quite line up ever. Right? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's I mean, Ron, Ron's attempt is probably the best of like having something where there is a single notion, computational notion. But, but I was going to say oh, along those lines, I mean, that, that may be just endemic to any kind of psychological theory that's not grounded in some sort of working system, right? I mean, you point to, you, you operationalize something based on intuition as opposed to based on uh, an actual functioning system. And as soon as you sort of uh, create a model of it, you're, you're able to say, all right, well, this portion is operating in a qualitatively different way than this portion. And I can that may be, but then you have to also ask, like, how much, to what extent is that what drives an explanation versus the computational level, the computation that is implemented on that architecture, right? Uh, Making uh, arbitrary uh, uh, distinctions uh, considering all the complex interactions and lots of different modules is certainly not a good idea, I would agree. And uh, sometimes it may be or may appear to be uh, arbitrary. But the beauty of computational uh, modeling and other or mathematical modeling is that you can uh, really pin down the details. So you can uh, look at the one person's uh, distinction drawing the line this way, and another person's distinction drawing the line the other way, and see which way provide better explanations. So in other words, we can, uh, drawing the line could be useful uh, in the sense that we can narrow in down the, 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 the differences and uh, understand the differences narrow, uh, and come to a convergence of uh, one uh, best way of uh, dividing the two systems. We might find that there aren't two systems. There's just a big interwoven mess of things, right? And also, there are people who uh, believe in uh, the system one, system two distinction, propose the three systems. There is a metacognitive So yeah, so there, there are lots of uh, uh, different opinions. But the debate is, uh, is, is healthy. I mean, it could help to uh, the, move the field forward to come to some kind of a consensus. The other thing that I actually wanted to follow up on that is that, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the debate is healthy. And um, the other thing is, to what extent is the debate uh, paradigm driven? Namely, that, you know, um, in, in uh, some studies that use, uh, you know, probabilistic, uh, a task that, you know, elicits probabilities, um, there's often uh, a constraint of saying, okay, well, these probabilities need to sum to 100, right? And so you're bounding people with probabilities, and you might not end up finding errors. Right? Well, people actually do end up. Uh, you know, if you don't provide that uh, uh, sort of restriction, then people may end up intuitively, you know, uh, generating errors that might not be caught there. And then the question is, well, you want to explain those intuitive responses in, in some fashion. Enforcing probability setting up to one almost never actually works empirically. So I showed you one example, and I didn't talk about the fact, but we gave them money and told them to divide it up and had to divide $100. And I highly recommend it. Nobody used that. That dependent measure, actually. We, we've also replicated the same experiments with that sort of a choose one and these other dependent measures, and they correlate very strongly. But there's, there is like, people are not good at giving numbers and making sure they sum up to one. When you force them to and make them think about it, their answers tend to coincide. But we should just pretend I never did that. And well, no, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a paradigm that's used by David Ober and other folks as well. And, and, you know, it, well, uh, you know, it, I think. What um, I think people's natural responses, people's uh, mistakes there in you know not summing to one or whatever, they're, they're interesting, and they they uh, they show that people aren't digesting every portion of the instructions. They're not um, sort of I, I think they're not deliberating. They're they're kind of intuiting the response. And that there's a uh, all right. Let me throw a different inflammatory <laughs> comment and distinction since we're having this. So. So this brings up something that I think also relates to the system one, system two thing, which is that the vast majority of our experiments in this field broadly construed are done in language. 
Um, and I think you know, language works a very particular way. Right? That was what part of my talk was about. And so it's extremely hard to distinguish the way language works and the, the way we use language from what we think we're getting as the sort of underlying reasoning. And, and I'm bringing this up, I guess, for two reasons. One is language is crappy at dealing with pro talking about probabilities. Right? Just, it's just not there. Like the best we can do is like talk about probability with numbers, and that was like bolted onto language and culture like a few hundred years ago. People are bad at it, um, and so like it's not terribly surprising to me if I'm if I focus on language as the way we're interfacing with these things that people are terrible at explicit probabilities, but okay when you just ask them for a judgment at integrating information. And it, you know it's possible that a lot of the system one versus system two stuff really is a question of kind of things that load on language and social interaction, paramedic interaction versus stuff that doesn't. Right? Like, that, that's a much more phenomenon or paradigm driven way of trying to make a distinction. I don't know if it's yeah, real. You're making a cut for us. Yeah, it's, it's a cut, I don't know. I mean, there, so there's my hypothesis. I will mention, so um, first off, uh, just to weigh in on the two systems debate, I mean, I'm sort of with Noah more so on this, and but I but I think the way to, to move forward here is through computational modeling. Um, so I work in the judgment and de decision making area, and when you talk about dual process theory in that uh, in in that field, it's it's all verbal descriptions for the most part. It's Kahneman's um, descriptions about what are the two systems, and the terms are thrown around just very loosely. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for developing computational models of single systems, dual systems, three systems, four systems, and then testing them, doing the model comparisons, doing what we do with computational models. So just putting it all into the mathematical computational framework and seeing what comes out. And um, I, I just think that this is an understudied problem. Um, and something that really should take a kind of a, a forefront if we want to move forward with using this type of terminology um, rigorously. I also think we need to look at more evidence from neurobiological um, studies because you talk about systems, especially when you start attaching words like affective system, which also often gets associated with the system one. This really starts to sound very much like brain areas to me. What are those effective, you know, amygdala-based systems? Do we see that sort of evidence? So I think, you know, we need to start moving beyond just verbal theories in order to actually cover some ground there. Um, then I wanted to get to your point about moving past sort of linguistic um, uh, task, and I completely agree with you, and it's something my lab's been trying to do more and more of is to come up with perceptual versions of classic kind of JDM type of task. We haven't done it yet for the causal reasoning stuff and something we've been thinking about because you're right. I mean, how much of this is tied to, um, to the language or even uh, in JDM is sort of value. How much is tied to subjective value of things versus kind of basic process. And so I think it's really important to try to think about designing task in parallel across domains. Um, so we've been pretty good at doing this in multi-alternative, multi-attribute choice. Um, so looking at, you know, you've got three things. Do you have to choose one? They've got two attributes. You get all of these a kind of classic effects in the JDM literature called the attraction, similarity, compromise, and there's a whole list of them. We've taken that entire set of, I think there's probably six, seven, eight different phenomena with this type of paradigm, and we've translated it all into a very simple perceptual geometric task. So you've got shapes, and we just ask people to choose shapes, and we can replicate um, a, a number of those, but sometimes we get things that are different. And so then it becomes a question of why, what, what was special about the words or the value in this higher level domain. So I, I completely agree. I'll, th I'll throw in one complication methodologically since the summer school and all that. Um, I, I think that's a great direction of making more diverse and, and less sort of linguistically loaded stimuli. One of the things that we've noticed in trying to do that, which actually made us go the opposite direction uh, toward, I'll get that in a second, is that a lot of the language that seems to control the cognition ends up in the instructions. 
sort of hidden up in the instructions, and then people will say, oh, there was no language here, so this happened in this, in, uh, this deductive inductive kind of thing. But actually, the instructions have a lot of rich language that, you know, kind of, you can either look at this as a, a uh, a difficult confound or a fascinating thing about people that like some sentences are able to totally program us to think about the task in a certain way and make certain kinds of judgments. Right? So you can either say, well, let's get rid of that too, and we'll just show people videos with no instructions whatsoever. And that's hard, but possible. Or you can say, which is kind of I kind of like this direction. You can say, well, let's actually just make ourselves the task of modeling the entire experiment, including all of the language that's in the experiment and the instructions. Yeah, that's hard, but I think it's kind of at the other noble end of the spectrum. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the more you can model, the better. <laughs> um, uh, so with the task we've done, we've, and I completely agree with you, instructions, there can just be so much kind of hidden there. We've come up with some pretty simple things like pick the biggest shape. Yeah. Like the instructions are pretty sparse. And we've actually come up with variants where we change the instruction. Like now you are a farmer and this is a plot of land and you want to pick the biggest one to maximize. And so we give all these complicated instructions. And we found that sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, so we have looked at this, but I do think in general there, it, an approach where you can not have to worry about that is, is probably best. Yeah, I mean, what I was going to say, I, I think we're in violent agreement here because, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, language is there for a reason. Uh, and, and you know, you, what you can do with language is express um, their highly abstract uh, uh, domains, things like causality, things like uh, time and, and quantity. Um, and, and then the question, you know, the, the, um, if, if you're able to come up with a paradigm and you find that, oh, there's, you know, distinct parallels between um, the sort of the, the pattern in the linguistic version and in the non-linguistic version, great, that's, that's fantastic. But if for some reason there's some discrepancy, then you don't know whether you're actually you know, matching the task, if it's a parallel task, or if there's some distinction there. So you know, it ends up being a tricky thing, and, and, the, uh, and the language ends up at least assuring you that you're tapping at that, um, at that constraint that you want, even though it might uh, engender some errors and, and lead to some errors. And moreover, like, language, you know, we're using language right now. Language is how we um, to navigate the world and talk about the world. And so, um, regardless of whether it leads to errors or, or whatever, it's still important to say, as we, we no doubt. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? I was wondering, uh, what does the model fail to explain on the Which are the main fields explore now since we've done plenty of modeling and we've explained a lot. If you didn't cover the misses, you covered what could have been explained, which was similar between the computer and the uh, human history now. Is that so, so can I, can I uh, I'll, I'll answer that, but I, I think there's actually a really important philosophy of science point here that was latent in all of our, our talks, which is there were two things that basically we were all doing. One was introducing a framework theory, and the other was applying it to specific you know, instances, case studies, and, and testing it. Um, here's the good and bad thing about a framework theory. You can't invalidate a framework theory. It's just a question of what does it stay silent on, right? What can you not use it for? What you can do is invalidate specific theories and sort of keep driving the framework to see like how crazy is it? You know, how many FSI cycles do I have to add, add to get something? So, so for me, I'd say like, you know, the there haven't been, I mean, uh, the, there haven't been a super lot of just like radically horrible misses. Um, there are some things that I still feel like I don't understand, um, and you know, so like, like in the hyperbole thing, we get relatively lower. We get a systematic. So this is very concrete. In the hyperbole thing. The model has a systematic tendency to predict lower outback ratings than people actually give when you ask about that. We think we know what to do about that because in the irony model where we extend the space of affect, it doesn't show that behavior, but you can could, could call that a, a specific miss. I think a much more interesting question for the framework theory that I showed you is that you know, it's really about a very particular part of cognition. It's about knowledge and inference, right? and maybe learning if you drop that in. It doesn't say much of anything, as I said, about process, right? 
So that's an important direction that, like, you know, some people are driving that way, but you know, there's a huge amount to say about like what are the processes and what aren't they. Um, it also doesn't have a huge amount to say about affect, right? About like the, the kind of emotional experience and like what is affect for, right? Um, so I think like there's a bunch of these things that clearly are part of cognition that you know the, the thing that I was talking about progressive programming sometimes we call it progressive language of thought stuff it's just not about that. Right? And whereas you know like um, everybody else to some extent was addressing process, right? So that's a thing. You know because. Well, it's uh, Thomas Kuhn's idea of uh, scientific paradigm, and that's relevant here. Uh, a cognitive architecture or, or a probabilistic framework, uh, they're basically a paradigm, and you're trying to use that paradigm to interpret more and more and more data. And sometimes you will encounter some difficulty, and sometimes you have to find a complicated way of accounting for that. And that's uh, 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 indication that the theory may not be uh, uh, on the right track. You may need to revise it somehow to maybe uh, adding a component. But that could also lead to problem because you may add more and more mechanisms into a model. Then it can account for a lot of things. But the complexity of the model is uh, makes this. Uh, uh, accounting for these phenomena uh, less uh, meaningful and less interesting. So what we want is to refine the mechanism, not making it more complex, but sometimes make it even simpler while accounting for a larger uh, set of uh, phenomena. And uh, so uh, being unable to uh, be unable to, to, to account for some uh, phenomenon could be a good thing. It's, uh, it drives the uh, the, the, the cognitive architecture or other generic models forward uh, help you to revise that. And we encountered that a lot over the past, I don't know how many years, 15 years or so. So, uh, so that is the process. And uh, it also uh, it depends on your selection of what task to look at. So personally, I'm interested in uh, social interaction, so uh, we're going in that direction. And so uh, does that mean that it can account for all the cognitive uh, details? Probably not. And so we'll have to select which way to go. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges for me is that, um, you know, the reasoning is uh, easier when you're able to separate it into different domains, something like syllogistic reasoning or temporal reasoning and, and all that. Um, but, you know, if, if, I, uh, if I'm serious about the idea that people are building models, then in fact, you know, we, re we reason all the time with highly complex assertions, things that involve lots of different domains. So if I said something like, you know, um, John always, drinking milk always causes John to be sleepy before bed, that is uh, quantified, that's causal, that's temporal. I mean, there's so much going on in that uh, assertion. So if somebody builds a model of that, what does that model look like? I can have a system that does temporal reasoning and, uh, and quantificational reasoning and, and causal reasoning independently, but what, what do those interactions look like and, and how are those models specified? That's, that's a long-term challenge. That's what that's the for. Yes. <laughs> that's the purpose only. So. so I will say with um, quantum probability theory, and this is true of classical probability theory as well, there's actually ways to really conclusively test um, so there's not just classical and quantum probability theory. There's actually a lot more probability theories out there as well. Um, and uh, you can actually set down sequences of equations. And if you violate our um, inequalities, and if you violate those inequalities, you don't use that probability theory. That means you've, you're not working within, let's say, classical. It's got its own inequalities. Quantum's got its own. And then if you're not quantum, you're some other probability theory, which we have not explored yet. <laughs> um, so I have not seen, people are talking about doing this type of test, um, these tests on whether or not people are quantum or something else. Um, I haven't seen anything that I would say is conclusive results about this, but there actually are ways to, to test these probabilistic theories, um, which could be really interesting to see what happens in the future. I kind of agree with that, or I definitely agree with that. I also kind of worry about that a little bit. So 
there are those predictions, those tests can be done, it's kind of cool and you learn something and sometimes what you learn is surprising depending on what you're testing, like this interesting paper by Fenton Costello and somebody else where they sort of revisit all of the, uh, many of the old biases with a little noise and discover it's like, sure, you know, radically right? different. I, the, the slight worry is that There's not a direct translation, maybe this is the same word, maybe I should shut up. There's not a direct translation from the experimental materials to those equations. There's a, there's a translation that happens. In that's a right. Of, uh, um, and that's why I said I haven't seen anything that yeah. I would, <laughs> would say is conclusive of, yeah. of any sort. I mean, people are attempting to do this, um, but that's where the yeah. magic has to happen, is you have to figure out how to do the experiment appropriately, and right. that's usually where it breaks down. This is actually a great example of why this is such a hard question, because it's like, you know, anytime you're doing experimental psychology, there's a bunch of, if, if a thing doesn't work, there's a bunch of places to attribute it and look for answers, and, you know, it's like, it's a judgment. It's Thank you. 